Well, hello there, and a very, very warm welcome to our webinar today. Uh, my name is Sharon Mark Teggart, and along with Sally, Dr. Sally Cathcart, we are the co-founders and directors of the Curious Piano Teachers. And today, uh, I was just saying before I came on uh, that I'm so excited that we are having this webinar today, and it's lovely to have Karen Marshall with us and also Rachel Topham from Faber and the topic is as you will know if you've registered for this the topic is beating the challenges of scales so the aim of this webinar is, is to give you new ideas a toolkit of approaches to help your piano students really thrive and grow through conscientious scale learning and playing and um, Karen has been filling us in a little bit so yes I'm, I'm really excited to get going Karen big big welcome to you to you all Oh, well, thank you so much for having me and, and um, just great to be with teachers talking about this topic. And I, I was confessing, wasn't I, that I am the girl that failed her scales apart from grade one and eight and um, sort of scales are something that I've battled with myself. And I just really hope that the, you know, this tool, this new book, and also the free scale challenge that goes with it is going to help teachers and most importantly, help your learners, you know, help your students. Yeah, absolutely. So, so super, super to have you here, um, Karen and Rachel indeed. And it's also super to have lots and lots of people flocking onto the call. So welcome to everybody whether this is your very first webinar with the Curious Piano Teachers or you are what we call an old hand at it all, then um, welcome to everyone. And it's really interesting, isn't it, Sharon and, and Karen, that so many people are interested in this topic on mm. scale. And, you know, we'd love to hear from you what your thought, what are the challenges for you about scales, your own personal challenges or your challenges as a teacher as well? So just drop, drop them into the chat box. Make sure your chat is to all panelists and attendees. You should see that you can be able to do it to all panelists and attendees, because otherwise only we get the panelists. We get to see what you're saying. And then actually half the fun of these webinars is that we connect together. You communicate with other teachers, not just in the UK, but possibly across the world, who knows? Um, and let us know what the, the challenges are for you. And I can see that people are already coming in. So, as I said, big welcome to this uh, curious webinar uh, with, with Karen as our guest. Um, I'm Sally and Sharon's already introduced us, her to you. We'd love to know as well if this is your very first webinar with us. Curious Piano Teachers, what are we about, Sharon, would you say? <laughs> well, I think at the Curious Piano Teachers, uh, we provide teachers with the opportunity and the resources to develop their teaching and playing skills and to fill in any of those knowledge gaps, which we all still have. Sally and I talk about the gaps that we still have in our teaching. We will never, ever be in that position where we go, <laughs> we're there, ever. We will never get to there. And that's the whole fun of it. Um, and I think what's really special about the Curious Piano Teachers is that we learn from one another. I mean, we have this saying that we, we love to learn as much as we teach. And I think that very much encapsulates us um, because we know that when we learn, um, you know, we're stronger when we all learn together. I mean, we have um, a Facebook group where our members are and it's like Sally and I the other day just described it as this like massive staff room. And Sally was talking about how um, we have something inside the membership site called curiosity boxes and Sally do you want to just share how you describe that well I said it's like for any of you who've worked in a school or in any any sort of um office or anything you walk into the the staff room or the shared space and on the on the shelves there are box files and for us, we have these curiosity boxes and it's like walking into a staff room where you know you're going to get a lovely warm hug when we're allowed to from people. You're going to be able to get your coffee and your favourite biscuits, whether they're bourbons or custard greens and a bit of cake or whatever. You're going to be able to share some chat about what's just gone well with your teaching. But even better, you can look at the shelves and there you've got 64 virtual boxes, each box crammed full of um, uh, and each box based around a topic. So we have got a box on sight reading. We have got 
boxes on uh, teaching beginners. We've got boxes at teaching ornaments. We've got oh, all sorts of boxes, anything I need. I just go and I go into my virtual staff room and just check. And all this, I think, Sharon, it gives us confidence, doesn't it? Confidence with the piano framework that we have there as well and teaching framework, which means that we can move away from the sort of the three pieces a year model, which can really quite dominate. And because we know that we've got the resources to develop our own teaching curriculum. And I think Sharon is showing you this uh, our brochure and we're going to be sharing that, I think, in the chat, aren't we, Sharon, in yes, a moment? But I think having that confidence to move into your own space as a piano teacher without relying on the three pieces a year and the particular scales that go along with it, nothing wrong with that, the scales and the exam grades, nothing wrong with them, but more than three pieces a year we definitely need to be working on. But sometimes it's hard, isn't it, because we don't quite know the way to do it without relating to somebody else. And this is why I love what we're doing with Karen today, because Karen has created this Piano Trainer Scales workbook. And again, that will give you the confidence to be able to teach scales, I think, because I'm very excited by it, to be able to teach scales without having to always refer, well, to grade one, you know, because what is grade one? Back to that old question. Well, for some grades, it does certain scales and for other boards, you do different scales. So lovely to see lots and lots of thoughts coming in about scales, about everybody, how, you know, learning to, to play them, getting students to learn fingering patterns. There we go. Well, yeah. I know Karen has got lots and lots and lots of ideas on that. So Sharon, are you going to share that link before we get started with everybody? I will share this link. Um, and it is yeah. just to let everyone know that we have a free one month trial. Um, if you just go uh, and put in Love Curious, um, which is the coupon code, and you can explore all those things with us. And then I think we're going to hand over to Karen. And, I think so, um, without further ado. <laughs> without further ado, you know, Karen, it's yeah. over to you. Oh, well, thank you. I've been, um, I've been writing away here all these questions so I can weave it in. So oh, I've lovely. been taking note from the chats. Okay, so thanks for all of these great interactions and questions, and I will do my best. So I'm going to start with um, my own scale story. And my own scale story is the fact that I really struggled with scales. So I, I did my grade one exam and I was fine hand separately. And then I started to play scales hands together. And I failed every grade in um, at scales from between two to seven until I got a new teacher um, for my grade eight. And this teacher totally transformed the way that I learned scales. Um, the gorgeous Enid Alterbridge, she left us a number of years ago, very um, a brilliant teacher from Leeds. And she totally changed the way I viewed scales. I started to enjoy them. I started to understand them. Now, because of my own journey, I was particularly conscious that scales could be difficult for some students. And throughout, you know, nearly, I hate to say nine, nearly three decades now, just about 30 years into teaching now, um, I've actually come up with various things um, to help with scale learning. And they have all been sort of put into this book in the, the actual scale, um, the scale coach items in there, which have all my ideas over those several, several decades. But let's talk about this book now. And why is it a bit different? So, um, I'm, I'm very lucky to have Rachel here today from Faber, who's helping me out with the technology. Um, and she's going to um, just show you the first page here. Um, she's going to show you the first slide 
which is just gives you a little snapshot in here. So if we have a look on the left hand side, you can see the format of how the key is produced, is introduced. So we've got C major there and you have the scale, you have the arpeggio and the broken chord, th three finger broken chord shape. Now, in we do actually, if we use grades, only use that shape at grade one or maybe um, possibly at grade two with the odd board. But usually it's only used in grade one. And actually, it's an incredibly useful shape. Um, and I have with my students over the years found massive benefit from them actually being able to play that shape in every single key because actually it's a great workout for the hand moving around the keyboard and keyboard harmony root first second inversion chords are there now if I go to the top there, you can see how I've introduced the scales. Now, we have a keyboard chart with the right hand and the keyboard chart with the left hand. How I teach scales is I start with the keyboard chart hands separately. And you can see that the actual thumb is circled on those keyboard charts as well. So I will begin simply with actually doing the first three notes um, of the scale. If, if that's what a student is, you know, co totally comfortable with, we then move to the first five notes. Now, that's very simple in the left hand. But with the right hand, you've got to, you know, move fingers around. And it's important that your student actually understands that, you know, we've only got five fingers and there's eight notes and you're going to be using different finger patterns that basically add up to eight. Um, I, I find that, you know, useful them to, for them to know. So we start off with the right hand um, or the left hand. We break up those patterns using the keyboard grid and all the time actually getting the student to look at that pattern. That pattern was absolutely life changing for me as a scale player, being able to see that pattern. Sometimes I'll get the students to actually, I, I have a, a set of rubbers, little topper rubbers that I actually get them to place on the keys. So they can actually, um, and they find that really fun to, to mark out the scale themselves. Or sometimes I'll get them to play them in clusters. So three notes at a time, and then the other finger patterns, it might be um, four next or, or whatever the patterns in, we do those in clusters. So as I say, you, you do it hands separately with the, the, the grids and then we move to the notation. And I think if you're doing hands together, it's helpful to be able to read it at the same time. You know, it's there, there for them. And, and it can really help with reading as well. It can help with reading. And that's the process that I take, you know, have done before I wrote this book and, and what is there now. Um, now, we're going to move on to the next slide now. Um, Rachel's really kindly going to show this. It's so important that our students see progress. And I trialed this in my practice probably about seven years ago now. And what the student does is they shade in the, um, the, the circle of fifths. They actually colour it in. Um, and they can see gradually this pattern of colour emerge of what scales that they've learnt. And this, this chart here, um, we've got all kinds of free goodies um, that we've given to the Curious Piano Teachers. You can have these charts, you can print them out, um, you know, for all your students. Um, and actually building it up via the chart has been immensely helpful, immensely helpful. Um, 
so we're going to move on again to the next slide. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and I'm going to talk um, also about the fact that I am dyslexic and mildly dyspraxic. So the reason that a lot of my problems came with scale playing was the coordination with the dyspraxia. But with the dyslexia, it was to do with the memory. And what happened was that there wasn't any additional things for me to hang on to to remember the scales. Um, the teacher that I, I was with at the time just simply would say, right, start on this note. Um, and I'd be I'd have fingering shouted at me throughout the session. Um, and I actually needed some additional things to help. I needed the patterns. Um, I needed to take the scale away from the actual um, lesson and to have a go in another way. And what, what I've done here, I've used this with my students for several years now. And, and basically, um, the actually having to theoretically know what scales a student is playing is very is very helpful all the keys are in the book the whole lot is in there um and so so the student actually has to be able to remember finger patterns they have to be able to write them down you know they're having to actually build up triad shapes you know in terms of the the broken chord they're understanding what they're actually playing you know they're fingering the arpeggio over and over so it's actually going in to the long-term memory and it's been embedded in there which is so important for our students with specific learning difficulties and and also this is different um this scale book is actually primarily about learning the notes, learning the fingering and having understanding of actually what you're playing, what keys it's, it's in, um, etc. That's what it's about. There's some very good other scale books that actually have duets in and little exercises to really, you know, do a lot of work on the beauty of the sound. This book actually is getting that foundational work in of, you know, what's the fingering, what's the notes. OK, so if we I have actually move if we move on to the next slide now, Rachel, um, we're going to move on to C minor. Now, there's been lots of debate um, about the order of the book, and I really should have explained it in the, um, the intro. How it works is it goes up in the circle of fifths in terms of sharps, and then it does the same in flats, but it's actually organized with the tonic major and then the tonic minor. And myself and Sally actually had a conversation about this because she's doing some work on her third book um, in her series on musicianship. And she was saying she too goes from like a major penta chord to a minor one. Um, and the benefit of doing this I, I confess is particularly for those with specific learning difficulties because it's far easier to be able to learn the minor if you've got the major and you're just looking at what the difference is. So, you know, it's still C to C, but we know that there's some different um, actual notation in there. In here, um, uh, the three minor scales are actually covered. So we have the harmonic minor that that went there first because it is the most common one that teachers use. I do, however, teach the natural minor myself. It's just a personal preference that I have. So I teach the natural minor. Um, then I teach the harmonic minor and then I teach the melodic minor, which has the natural minor descending and and only one note added to it to the harmonic um so so that's actually how um <clears throat> how it actually is 
it's organized in there. So I would recommend, you know, looking at, you know, doing natural minors, then the harmonic, then the melodic. It, it really does work very, very well. Now, um, I'm going to just digress a little bit and just to actually go to some of your questions because I think it's so important to actually make sure you get out of this session what you are looking for. So some of the questions here that I have got, um, somebody's asked about remembering the sharps and flats. So I've got various ways of doing that. Um, one of them is actually via pictures um, and children actually have pictures of a particular scale. I had one child that E flat major was the elephant scale um, and she had an elephant there and it was, I, I can't quite remember what was on the, on the page. I think the, the, yeah, there was a balloon up there and the elephant was yeah, eating an apple. So it was very, very memorable for her to have that wacky picture. And <clears throat> if you talk to somebody, you know, you see on the television, these people with amazing memories. I saw a lady yesterday who'd memorized hundreds of numbers and she'd done it by a story. And our brains are very, very good with stories. So another type of thing, so we've got the picture there, you know, of, of ways of remembering the sharps and flats. Another way of doing it is actually with a story. You know, what is the story of B flat major, you know? And, you know, that can include looking at the distance between the notes. So going from B flat to C, well, you know, sometimes we'll talk about, um, you know, jumping or stepping off um, a black note. So if, you know, bridge, I talk about bridges. Um, is it is it a big jump? Is it a little, you know, little step, etc. Um, so it's I'm trying to monitor the, the um, chat at the same time. So sharps and flats, thinking about stories, thinking about images, also looking at the patterns of the black notes um, on the on there as well. Making scales fun. Well, I think the important thing about making scales fun is actually making them manageable. So a student actually um, can can manage what you are giving them to do. So not giving them too much. Um, that was something that, you know, I look back on as a teacher that I did overload at times. So sometimes with some of my students, it's simply the first five notes. And we make it fun as well via the scale challenge. And I will come on to that, you know, um, that can really give sort of sort of sequence goals. Um, the other thing that I do to make it fun is to get the child to practice it as different characters. So we can say that we're going to be um, Little Miss Stroppy today, or we're going to be, um, you know, Louis Legato today, we're going to be Susie Staccato, um, and, you know, playing a scale in a dramatic way. Um, and making it sort of more creative um, with improvisations, et cetera, with backings um, as well. So questions, staccato scales. I do actually have some modeling videos that I make for my students so that they, that, so I will model a scale in terms of, you know, a really good staccato touch. Um, the modeling is also really useful in terms of tone production. The child's got a little video there to look at. Hands together. Hands together is best to be done in the smallest of fragments. So actually just doing the first three notes 
and then gradually building it to the, to the next five, adding on one at a time if needed, taking the student off the piano, off the keyboard and doing it on a tabletop and taking away the other senses. So you're just feeling what, you know, what the hand is doing kinesthetically. That's another helpful thing for, you know, hands together scales. Um, we talked about, yeah, listening and appraising, I would add as well. Actually, um, in the book, there's a, there's a lovely quote by Murray McLaughlin. Scales require stamina, strength, shape, security, and sparkle. They're an essential tool for a pianist. So what I'd say is that you, you need to actually get your student to be able to actually assess themselves what a good scale is. You know, um, until they're able to hear and evaluate, that can be very challenging. That can be very challenging. So moving on, um, Rachel, can we go back to um, the slides and we're going to look at diminished and dominant sevenths. So basically, in the book, you've also got um, at the back, you have, so all the keys are introduced. And then at the back, you've got additional things. So there's chromatic scales, contrary motion, arpeggios and broken chords in different variations. Now there's just samples there of particular ones. And that's done on purpose. Because actually, if you've got a model there and a student has to actually go in and take that model and move that pattern of tones and semitones, etc., actually around the keyboard and discover it themselves, which is a very Kadai approach, you know, thing, discovering it themselves, then there's amazing learning there, absolutely amazing learning. So that's why every single one of them is not listed, because this is about empowering our students to actually discover, to discover themselves. Okay, so if, if you want to go on to the next slide, Rachel. Thank you, thank you. So, um, I've put in the um, major and the minor pentatonics. Does anybody use these in their teaching at the moment? Is anybody using them currently? You see, I use these shapes as the format, um, as the formation for my, for my improvisation. So um, these particular pentatonics get, yeah, uh, improvisation, they are the most fantastic shapes for improvisation and also for a, the, we, the, the ABRSM doesn't do it anymore, but I still actually um, use, do melody to words. So they're great for um, if you're going to do writing a melody. These pentatonic scales are the ultimate. Uh, and we've got Cyrilla here, who's our, our Kadai queen. And um, she's she actually taught me these pentatonic scales, um, actually, when I did my Kadai training. And I use them all the time. Um, and Ellie also is saying about actually using them to introduce the blues scale. Absolutely. They're excellent um, for doing that too. So um, let me just talk you through a few more things in the book. So I've talked briefly about the scale coach items. So, um, there's some other ones in there that you might find useful. Um, one of them, 
on which scale coach two is actually making little cards so you can actually get and i got them from tesco's actually you can actually get little whiteboard cards just little ones where you can write on them and my students have a set of these little cards and we write out the letter names of the scales on there and then they have to write in the actual um <clears throat> sharps and flats in there um, as well that's that's one thing that i found really really helpful and to actually get the student to say it forwards and backwards and also to sing it because and um, we're talking uh, anastasia is talking about singing yeah that's really important it was a shock to me my students couldn't sing a harmonic minor scale they couldn't sing the melodic minor scale they had no problem with singing the um the, the actual major scale but those those minor scales they couldn't do and actually teaching them to sing the scales first is 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 just a lifeline for them because they can hear actually what they are trying to produce you know it's the sound before the symbol um and and it's incredibly helpful some other little scale coach ideas in here um again the importance of theoretically knowing the patterns of tones and semitones as well it works brilliantly for some children some children you know don't find it as useful a tool but I, I try and reinforce it over and over so it becomes something in their long term memory, but knowing that pattern so they've got something else to fall back on. Um, another thing is, is actually, um, let me just find it, the importance of consistent fingering and actually getting a student to sort of really focus in on that fingering and um, to be able to even organize fingering into different groups you know what are all the scales that have the same fingering as c major well we've got e major you know we've got c minor etc um, and actually being able to put it in in those groups is is very helpful now we are coming on to <clears throat> the piano trainer scale challenge now so can you share this to all the teachers um rachel so let me tell you the story between behind the piano trainer scale challenge as all of you are aware um basically we we had some new exams come out didn't we um with uh trinity and also abrsm offering recorded exams and what's become much much more prominent has been um the fact that some students i've got 25 percent of my students just wanting to do these pieces only exams now and Basically, I wanted to have a framework that I could use and not rely on actual exam board scale syllabuses anymore. Now, I'd been kind of doing some of this anyway, but I wanted something that was more concrete. And I was very, very lucky because I, I, I had this idea um, just after the ex new exams came out and i went to faber and like lightning um they actually said yes karen we'd love to do this which i'm incredibly grateful for so how the piano trainer scale challenge works is is that there are four different levels however there are commendation certificates as well so if you do an extra 10 shapes you can actually give your student a, a certificate as well so we start with crystal level and um and and 
they in the crystal level the student actually only has to do um two keys but in that key and um, you as the teacher can decide what that key is um yes i i uh, diane's talking about uh, trinity exam yes i'm aware that they still do the scales um, in there. Um, I know it's a reduced amount, isn't it, from actually what's in the exam. So, <clears throat> but I, I mean, I use them myself. It's, it's an excellent um, product is actually the Trinity exam with the scales. So on the crystal level, there's two keys. You as the teacher decide what those keys are. Um, but I've suggested in there that they do the arpeggio, the broken chord um, as, as well as that. So they learn it all in one. Um, there's just two shapes and then there's a contrary motion and there's a suggestion for a chromatic. So you start with crystal level. So you've got two actual key centers there. After you've done the crystal level and you have to start with two, then it actually moves on to an additional four keys. You again, as the teacher, decide on what those keys are. It's your choice. Um, I did this as well because if I've got students doing certain repertoire, I want the scales to actually reinforce that, you know, that actual um, key, key, the key sense, the key sense. Um, with these levels, there are resources with them. So you have here an assessment um, challenge sheet. So you put the child's name on it and you say what they have to do. And you also say what your teacher assessment criteria is. You decide it. And in the challenge, there's, I put advice on how you would do this. But if you've got a special needs student that really struggles with a certain level of accuracy, you can adjust that. So you decide the assessment criteria. And the other thing about this is it's formative assessment. So summative assessment is it's a flashpoint in time. The student goes into the exam. They get the mark um, for their scales at that time. However, um, it might not go very well on the day or it might go brilliantly on the day. What we've actually thought about here and um, there was sort of a lot of discussion about this with colleagues, my, my colleagues or the teachers advising me, um, is the fact that you know your student the best. And what's so lovely is you can decide what's gonna be achievable for them. But on the day of your assessment, if a particular scale doesn't go particularly well, it's absolutely fine because you're looking over a period of time and you can actually say, you know, you can pull it all together and assess it over that period. The other nice thing, um, so you've got your criteria there and then you put your comment in. Now, what I loved about doing the comment was that I could make, I could talk about the, the actual sound of the scale and how well the child had remembered it, but I could also talk about their learning journey. I could say it was excellent that even though you were struggling with the finger pattern of E flat major, you showed massive resilience and, and actually conquered this over a period of time. So you're able to give very personal comments that actually aren't possible, you know, in, in other situations. If you have a student who simply cannot manage to play the whole scale, they can only do, say, five fingers of it. I mean, I've had some special needs students where this has been the case. Um, you can adapt it. 
you can actually adapt the challenge. It's, um, it's written in how you would adapt it and you can make it so that that student is still playing scales but they might just be doing you know five finger um, pentascales instead so there there as i say there's four levels so silver we add on another six shapes and then at gold you have to do the whole lot so gold is substantial because it's all major and two types of minor scales as well so it's very very substantial um with the um challenge you if rachel do you want to show the next chart um slide here so this is all of the resources that you get so you get the explanation of the challenge you actually get some if you did want some more help on what scale shapes to use you've actually got some examples there for the different levels you've got step by step on how to create your assessment um, that's that's all there as well some statement examples again if you want to have some statements there's some can you put you can pull off and you it also has um you know this this lovely circle of fifths diagram so if your student loses it um you know you've got lots there lots lots there in a in addition i there are certificates so if we go on to the next um the next stage you've got certificates there i just print them out on card and um the children are very very happy with them and and also there's some frequently asked questions there as well so that is the scale challenge now i'm sure there are questions so i'd like to just finish there to take some questions, if that's okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Karen. That was, it's really exciting to, to hear all your plans. And I think the scales challenge in particular um, could be a really, really big boost to, to teachers who just need that extra motivational factor for, for getting students to do it. Cause we know they all love their challenges, don't they? yeah so i mean there was a lot to take in there so do people have any questions about the you know so if you've got any questions at all about the challenge or any other any other section of it i mean going back we've got anna and i think you've probably answered this she says are all keys and scales yes. featured in this book so well all the keys um are featured so you get the major scale the harmonic the melodic and the natural minor you get the arpeggio in root position and also the broken chord in the root first and second inversion not all of the what i would call exotic scales are in there um mm. you know there's samples of them all and then it's sort of the teacher's got the opportunity to work with that shape and to take it in different positions around the keyboard. Super, lovely. Uh, Paula, I think you you might have answered this with the with the scales challenge. She says, how to get how do you get pupils to practice this system when parents are so predominantly achievement possessed? Yeah. 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 Well, well, actually, the if you empower the child to actually see the benefits of it i've i actually haven't had any issue with getting parents to switch to it because the um the child actually has preferred it because the the scales are linked to their pieces and it's the keys of the pieces they're playing it seems more relevant to them you know um, yes i would agree i think both sharon and i find oh, once you get them to take okay. ownership as well which obviously this book does it makes a huge difference doesn't yeah. it sharon yes oh completely karen thank you i've been just jotting down notes as i've been going on i mean i love that you are 
you have looked at how can I empower students to discover themselves in this book. That's, I mean, so valuable. And just want to give a shout out to Cirilla. It's lovely to have you yeah, on yeah, the call. Yeah, yeah, Cirilla. Yeah, <laughs> um, absolutely. Who, as as Karen's just said, is is Queen of Kadai, and you know, being able to sing, you know, they can work out their skills by ear. They can discover. It's just it's such an important thing for for us teachers, I think, to remember to make sure that we're teaching in such a way that we're actually handing over power to them and helping them to be the hero of their own musical musical journey. So um, that that was lovely. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think Cyr Cyril is talking about singing and naming the notes. Yes, that is very important. So I will get the child to sing the letter names of the scale as well. Um, yeah. it, it's incredibly beneficial and also to actually stride. So if you you can actually walk the scale. So if you do a big step for um, a tone or a little step for a semitone or a really enormous step for a tone and a half, you can actually get them to sing it, but to actually walk the pattern of the scale at the same time. That works very well. Yeah. Ah. yeah. That's and long, <laughs> let, I'm just longing for the moment that I can get my floor spots out again when they yeah. all come back to, to live lessons. You know, I used to have a lot of fun with floor spots and things, but um, yeah. there are a couple of questions here what was i've just lost one something about a pentascales and how to i've lost it there we go would you oh, oh, ask okay. would you start younger students with pentascales in the different keys before coming to the long these longer ones in the book Karen? absolutely i do mm -hmm. yes and in fact your book does that doesn't it sally it does it does you know and thank you for mentioning it um and as you say i'm just working on literally this this next song that i'm doing is chumbara which has got chum 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 which is the 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 diatonic major scale you know and getting them to sing it in the soul bar say the letter names as well as as they yeah. sing the scale it is absolutely so so crucial so important but book two yes we have pentachords in there definitely yeah um, and also if, if you do use tonic sulfur actually singing the sulfur as well yeah, you know yeah. is incredibly beneficial i think i've confused everybody with the these little cards um <laughs> Sally, let me explain the little <laughs> yes cards. explain the little card paper now um so so basically um the chat the student will have some white cards um you can buy a pack of like mini whiteboards this size at tesco so the child will write on the cards all the different letters and and they place them actually on the music stand so we'll have c d e f g a b c you know etc and then if you're turning the major scale into the minor scale, you can have it there as the major. And then you can actually write on the, the cards, the accidentals for the minor scale. And, and it's, it's very helpful to actually get the child to almost create their own scales with the cards. Yeah, yeah. Does that explain yeah. that for Joanne? <laughs> So are you getting Joanne, them to, us know. to go, Karen, then from, so for example, they're writing out the G major scale and then you're getting yeah. them to, you know, the third and the sixth note. If you flatten those, it becomes, you know, the B and the E becomes B flat yeah. and E flat. And then they're playing the tonic. So, and I mean, and you've done this, you've done this earlier and I love this. It's helping students to go to take what they know, you know, they know the G major scale and then go to that related unknown and where they go, oh, that's, you know, if, if I've got, if I know a major scale, like I know C major scale. So if I flatten the third and the sixth, that is going to give me the, the harmonic minor scale. Yeah, love that. That's very helpful. Um and I, I discovered that because of my dyslexia training. So mm. if you're dyslexic, you've got to go from the, from the known to the related unknown. And I was teaching everything yeah. by relative minors. 
but I found that they found it much easier mm. to learn the minor scale if it went from the major to the minor. Yeah. And as you say, you're discovering what those changes are. Yes, it, it is the letters that are on the cards, the actual note, note letters on there. Mm -hmm. I, I think the other word that keeps popping up today, and it seems to be a constant theme for me over the last three or four weeks as I've been working on wine books, is are the words tonic and dominant. Yeah. And the importance of using those words in teaching and when we're talking about key centres, you mm. know, so that we're talking about tonic major and tonic minor. Absolutely. It, you know, these are functional names, aren't they, Karen? And you're, you're using but, them frequently. Yeah. Totally. And, and in fact, the, the actual order of the book does go up, actually, in the, it goes to the dominant next, yeah. you yeah. know, in there. Yeah. Um, and, and the terminology, again, is vital that it's consistent and that it's constant. Because again, putting my learning difficulty hat on, Children, the biggest problem that they'll have is when people use different language. So yes. they'll be in one yes. setting where somebody's talking about an ostinato, somebody else is talking about a rift, you know, and somebody else is talking about a repeated pattern. It's all the same thing. But, you know, if you do have difficulties in that area, then it's a problem. So con there has been an effort for consistency of language as well, you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, I quite agree. We have this thing, be persistent and consistent in your use of terminology and don't stop, keep being persistent. I, I, I'm just going to come back. We, we've got an interesting discussion, I think, potentially here about the difference between when you eat, when you use solfa, you know, obviously we we we're do re mi fa so la ti do, and then la ti do re mi fa so la, and yes, those two absolutely connect together, and I found that a very powerful way of understanding. I would love to hear your thoughts, Karen, about understanding the relative major and minor. I I do think though, when you come to the piano, there is a different connection also to be made as well as that one and that is what we're just talking about about the dominant the tonic major and the tonic minor because the pattern on the keyboard provides a better connection sometimes yeah. than the connection in the sulfur and together we we have to marry the two things together that's my feeling somehow yeah i would say i mean i we're both kadai practitioners aren't we sally yeah yeah and so what I, I say, Kadai is basically, I use it appropriately to the piano when appropriate. But sometimes just simply because it was developed around the voice, yeah. sometimes it's not appropriate for the piano. And I mean, Cyrilla would, you know, agree with that as well. You, you know, the, so, so you wouldn't learn the same um patterns you've got to do certain patterns differently um <laughs> you, you just have to what's cyrilla saying i've missed we're that. laughing at cyrilla's <laughs> comments sorry the comments for anybody who's <laughs> for anybody who's watching this and sees <laughs> yeah um yeah i i i because I'm spending a lot of time, and I think I did it in last week's Tuesday's teaching tip, you know, with my students, just getting them to play up the half steps and the whole steps on the yeah, piano, because totally. that's one of the things they have to understand. And we get that better, I think, that keyboard geography, it's connecting, isn't it? Yeah. Keyboard geography with key understanding with solfa and three things there, all to marry together at the piano, really. Yeah, the thing is as well, Sally, with the solfa, it's a lot of it is linked to the muscle memory of the vocal cords. Mm. So with the piano, you're also dealing with the muscle memory of the patterns in there too. You know, have we just lost Sally? <laughs> I think we maybe have. Oh, just for a moment. But yes, yes. I mean, what a it, it was really interesting just linking back with what you were saying um, about how you failed your scale section. Um, everyone else still there? I think I seem to have, yes, Karen is still there. <laughs> um, 
But for example, you're just talking, Karen, about muscle memory. Um, if, as an, if as an advanced student, um, I had been asked to play, let's say, E flat minor with just a single finger, or before you play it, call out the letter names that you're going to use, because I kind of only knew it, and I was aware of this obviously much later, of how to play this scale because of the muscle memory of yeah. how it felt in my fingers. If I was to just play it, you know, single finger on notes, I would have really struggled to do that, which meant, of course, I didn't know the scale in an inside out way that I needed to. Yeah, actually being able to do it in lots of different contexts also makes it much safer. So if you were using this in an, an exam situation, when the nerves come in, it's you secure. actually can do it because you've learned it in so many different ways. Right. And, and I, yeah, it, it really does help. One thing I know I also really love to do is instead of asking for a scale, you know, so for example, asking for A flat major, I'll hold up a, a flash card with the key signature, three flats. Yeah. And I'll say the major scale. Because of course, when you say A flat major, play me the E flat major scale, they know where to start. And even if they don't know it, that's where it all starts to get a bit bumpy. But you give them the key signature and they've got to think, okay, so what, what major scale? Has, has three flats. And again, it's going back to what you said about reinforcing and applying it to different contexts. You know, so yeah. That, that's a lovely idea, Sharon. I shall try that tonight. <laughs> and I think that's the thing, isn't it? We're, we're all learning and sharing together, aren't we? Which is, you know, what, what it's all about. But I, I mean, I really hope that the the actual challenge in the book just helps teachers to empower their students because I just was desperate for something to help me and and I tried so hard but I just couldn't do it until I was given more tools you know to be able to do it you know and, and I think and I think that's that's the the important thing to have enough tools in there. Um, just very quickly, is it possible for Rachel to just quickly show the rest of the Piano Trainer series? Yeah, Shall absolutely. We? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to show you quickly and Karen might just um, have a minute or two to talk through the rest of the series. Um, and then obviously um, I want to just make sure that I share the offer code with you as well. And yeah, so just a couple of wonderful. questions about, um, someone asked, is the book going to be available in PDF format? So we would usually bring out an, an ebook version um, of a book, but um, we usually um, do that, at, you know, no, no sooner than six months after the publication of, an, uh, of a physical book. So watch this space. Um, but yeah, I'll just share that now for you, Karen. So the book, the book actually does, oh, sorry. Uh, the book supports the foundation level. Um, so the foundation pin is books are post grade one to post grade two. And basically the foundation books focus on technique with repertoire and also there's theory, everything's linked in there. And there's lots of arrangements in there by David Blackwell, who's a phenomenal arranger of core orchestral repertoire. And um, the book two has got the aquarium in that's in Trinity grade four and the clock piece by Haydn, which is in Trinity grade three exam syllabuses. So these are just some samples in there of, of you know, there's some lovely core cool repertoire, but also sort of musical training and the time period. So that's the, the, the foundation pianist. 
the intermediate pianist actually I was I, I did visit the Curious Piano Teachers three years ago um, about this book. This again is, um, this is focusing on style. So there's 25 styles across the series. Again, with um, actual theory, technique, um, musicianship activities all incorporated. Now there's lots of quick learn pieces because how many times do we get books where um, you know the student never gets through it? There's loads of pieces in there that are two grades below to make sure they do get through. And finally, the advanced pianist um, is, is actually grade six plus to eight. Um, that book was written with Mark Tanner um, uh, as a concert pianist where he talks about interpretation and the lovely Dawn Wakefield, who I know is on, she's been using the advanced pianist um, books, um, which I've been very grateful to her for. She's had some wonderful comments and some feedback for me on them. So that again goes back to period, um, but they have composer galleries in. So you get a number of pieces from easy, moderately difficult to very difficult, um, where you can actually showcase a composer as well. So that's the Piano Trainer series in a nutshell. There's eight books that they scale one and then post grade one right up to grade eight that's so wonderful <laughs> and i just want to draw your attention to the discount code um so if you go to favormusic.com forward slash shop we're running an exclusive discount code cpt21 to get 20 percent off the piano trainer scales workbook um, and that's running until the 31st of March. So um, do get yourself a copy. The um, Scales Challenge is available to download for free on that product page. And the Curious Piano Teachers will also, also have the, um, all of the pages from the Piano Trainer Scales Challenge um, available from their site as well. Yeah, there's lots of space to write on the scale book as well. You know, we, we there's there's lots of blank space, so you can actually write your own teacher notes. There's even blank staves on there, so if you want want to write things out, so you know you can actually make notes on there for your student as well. So okay, awesome, and we're in perfect time. That's wonderful. Just want to say a massive, massive thank you to Karen Marshall and also to Rachel Topham for yes. joining us today uh, at the Curious Piano Teachers. Um, Sally and I have really appreciated um, giving off your time and also, and I can see that people have been really appreciating uh, that discount code. So thank you so much, Rachel, for, for that as well. Welcome. Sally? Great to have yeah, you back. I've, I've managed to get back here, restart the computer. But yes, huge thanks, Karen, uh, for, well, thanks for, so much for having me. Yeah, everything you've shared and, and Rachel for being there as well and for the discount code and all the support, Karen and Rachel, that, that you and Faber give to teachers um, in helping them to learn as much as they teach, probably. Oh, thank well, you very much. Yeah, they, they say a good teacher is a willing learner, don't they, Sally? Absolutely. Absolutely, Karen. So yeah. True. yeah. But, um, it's lovely to, to have been with everybody. I really appreciate it. Super. Great stuff. I will be um, getting the replay video out to everyone with all of those associated links um, just to click on uh, for ease. So I will be getting that sorted out. Um, probably it'll be a little, a little later on tonight um, or even first thing tomorrow morning, but do uh, check your, your inbox and that will be there. And happy teaching. Have a wonderful rest of the afternoon. Bye. Bye. -bye.